Okay, so this is going to be chapter two. And this, um, along with chapter one, represents the um, two chapters in essence that give you kind of a, an introduction to what it means to think like an economist and be an economist. And as I was thinking about it, it makes me think like an economist is like a, I don't know, like a, a lion or a tiger or an elephant at the zoo, where obviously there are people who focus on studying that animal and, and their habitat and their habits. And it's kind of like an economist, because in this case, we're saying the economist has to be, um, how do they think and how is that different than um, the rest of us? Although it is somewhat true. I mean, when I tell people um, I'm an economist and let's say they already kind of sort of know me, some of them seem to think, ah, that makes sense given how he talks and how he thinks. And it might seem odd to some people how I, I act, but I am in essence an economist. Um, okay, so thinking like an economist. So economics is a science. In fact, among the social sciences, it self considers itself the king of social sciences, which is kind of um, presumptuous if you ask me, but what the way that economics differs from the other social sciences. Um, let me give you one example, is that when I was in graduate school, when I got my PhD, the other social sciences like political science, like psychology, all had to learn a second language and they all had to take a exam in their proficiency of like knowing French or knowing German. Economists did not have to do that. We actually just took all the same um, classes as the um, uh, graduate students in mathematics. So we went through calculus one through four, differential equations, um, linear algebra one and two. And in going through all that, basically math was our foreign language. And I say that because as the second part of this slide indicates that economists do devise their research as if they were scientists, where they have a theory according to the book, then they collect data to either prove or disprove that theory, and that they do use the scientific method. And yes, there's an extent to which psychology does that, and even an extent to which it's done in um, um, political science. But this is the essentially the primary way that economists act. Oh, there's another joke here. I'm a social scientist, Michael. That means I can't explain electricity or anything like that. But if you ever want to know about people, I'm your man. Hmm. Okay. Well, these are really bad jokes. I, I do not preview the jokes. So um, I did not choose this book because of the jokes. I don't know if the jokes are in the textbook, but if they are, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's talk about why is the scientific method so important? Because what it does is it basically follows a process of devising a theory and then collecting that op those observations into data that's then used to prove or disprove that theory. Um, although conducting experience in economics, as it says here, is impractical, um, experimental economics seems to take these kind of waves where it was done a lot in the 1960s and then is being done quite a bit, um, I don't know, about 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, so it does go in these kinds of waves of being used a lot or not. Um, and, um, you know, there, there's even some that are being done on the islands. Um, there's some economists at, uh, at uh, Manoa who do research on like incentivizing people, how much you have to pay them for them to adopt certain habits, better habits, um, you know, which would be important because it's easier to incentivize people to adopt a good habit rather than force them to adopt a good habit. And what's really important, just like in all kinds of models, models are built based on theories that employ certain assumptions. Those assumptions or generalizations are used to, to simplify 
a pretty complex world, right? So we could say something like, uh, I'm from Wisconsin originally, all people from Wisconsin love to eat cheese. Well, of course there are lactose intolerant people. And of course there are people who moved to Wisconsin from a neighboring state and didn't like cheese. So yes, they are from Wisconsin now, but they don't like cheese. Um, but if I wanna say something like, wow, people from Wisconsin die 15 years earlier than everyone else in the country. Well, maybe I'd wanna do use that generalization that all people from Wisconsin like cheese to then start to make some sort of argument in terms of correlation or hopefully causation uh, with eating cheese and dying early of heart disease. Now, to the extent that that's a bad assumption, I'm gonna be making bad conclusions, right? So then it's all about refining the assumption to be able to refine the conclusion. Right, so maybe as I do this more over time, I could start to get to a part of the study where for every year you live in Wisconsin, you die six months earlier because you ended up eating more cheese because it was so easy to access and so cheap. So you build up different assumptions um, and you refine your assumptions as you get more data. So what are these models consist of? Well, there, there's obviously a theory with it, but most of it is actually does come down to um, equations. And in these equations, what we're trying to do is we're trying to measure, quantify the degree of the influence, right? Specifically, economists from a statistical perspective quite heavily rely on regressions where we say that there's some variable that depends on a host of other variables and how much they move right so if i want to say i would like to know about life expectancy i would say that it's a function of a whole bunch of things right so it could be a, which is consumption of cheese. B, which is, I don't know, um, watching football. C, I don't know, drinking beer. D, right, and I would go on and on and on. And then not only that, not only am I listing all of the factors, but I'm also giving it a um, degree of influence, right? So maybe I would assign this a 0.4. Maybe I would assign this a 0.1. Maybe I would assign this a 0.2. Maybe I would assign this, right, a 0.8. These are all different things, right, that we would say um, well, in fact, these would all be negative because they're reducing my life expectancy. Right, so this could be for every pound of consumption of cheese that I engage in, it reduces my life expectancy by a factor of 0.4, negatively speaking. So there's some things like watching football, which, yeah, it reduces your life, but not that much as compared to, I don't know, I guess this would be like, drinking and driving, an incredibly dangerous activity that heavily reduces your life expectancy, right? And as I start to, again, to refine my model, I start to refine what's important and not. And again, there's some simplification in this. Maybe there's some good cheeses out there and maybe there's some bad cheeses. Maybe there's some good beers and maybe there's some bad beers, beers right? And is it drinking and driving in a sports car or is it drinking and driving in a big truck or in a moped? Uh, yeah, I don't know. But again, these models would be refined over time with the equations being represented as regressions that tell us the degree of the influence. Now, economists also like to build these kinds of visual models. And in these visual models, <laughs> The one that we see quite often in the um, um, that economists make on a very simple basis is a circular flow model. And in this circular flow model, what's being um, tracked is how the money flows between households and firms, 
for goods and services and inputs. Now, I think, don't know why they, I guess we, I'll finish explaining it and then it's gonna show us the picture of what it looks like. So like a, it's kind of like a circle. So basically on one end you have households and on the other end you have firms and they're exchanging money, one for selling their labor who then gets their money for their labor in the form of a paycheck. And then they use their paycheck to buy goods and services, sometimes from those exact same firms. Let's just jump ahead to it. So here we go. Here is an economic model, right? So we have two actors here, firms and households, and they each serve specific roles within a firm it produces goods and services, and it also buys labor and it buys inputs to make those outputs. So what is it doing, right? Is it, the firm is buying labor. It's buying raw materials. And it's paying, right, so that's, this. So here the work is flowing from households to firms. They're selling their labor services. They're selling their raw materials. And the firm is paying for it as measured right here. And that flows to the households. Those households in turn spend their money to buy goods and services. Now, to understand the economy better, what you can see is that bad things can happen very quickly if all of a sudden firms get scared and they get rid of their workers. Because if they get rid of their workers, then the workers have no money to spend. That's kind of like a recession as we'll learn in this course, right? So it only takes one part of this model to fail to do what it's doing for the entire flow to stop and the entire diagram to stop being circular. And so what economists then spend their time doing is looking at this model and trying to find points where the economy is starting to falter and not doing what it's supposed to be doing. Another model that economists build is an incredibly important one called the production possibilities frontier. And imagine this as a, a country as a whole, an entire economy, being able to produce two goods. Now name the goods whatever you want. Um, the, the classic one is guns and butter, but let's just take, let's just do this on a new page here. So let's draw this. Here's our X and Y axis, right? This is my Y axis. This is my X axis. Now you'll notice here in chapter two that there is a math appendix. I am not covering that in this course. If your weakness is math and the appendix is difficult for you, um, please reach out to me personally and um, I'll work with you um, to cover that appendix. Now, on these two axes, I'd like to label two different products. Quantity of skills. Test the rainbow. Love skittles. Who doesn't like skittles? Um, and on the y axis, let's talk about nacho fries. Dude. Taco Bell's got nacho fries back. So quantity of nacho fries and quantity of Skittles. These two goods have no relationship to each other. But now here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine an economy, a country that does nothing but produce these two products. You are either involved in nacho fry production 
for Skittle production. And so imagine that this country has, let's say, 100 million people. One million, I don't know, one million pounds of sugar, one million pounds of nacho seasoning. Um, you know, and list and keep listing all these different resources, natural resources that the country has. And so then what you would do here is you would say, what if everyone in the country just did the extreme? And we just said, we don't like Skittles. Let's only focus on natural fry production. So let's just put this point right here. So this would be how many natural fries could be produced if 100 million people used all of their sugar, all of their natural seasoning, everything else in the country, and they only made natural fries. So I don't know, it'd be something like 67 million nacho fries and zero Skittles. This isn't saying like what people want to eat. We're just saying what could they actually produce? Because again, this is called a production possibilities frontier. Now, what if on the other hand, they decided to produce the opposite extreme? What if they only produced Skittles. Then they would be making zero nacho fries and let's say 15 million bags of Skittles. Okay, well, both of those seem pretty extreme. Those are extreme examples of just producing, just producing, not talking about consumption, just producing one or the other. Now, what if there's some sort of combination? What if they just say, everyone who lives east of the Mississippi River is gonna make Skittles, everyone who lives west of the Mississippi River is gonna make, make nacho fries. I understand saying Mississippi River is my point of reference is kind of a mainland thing, but you know, applies to us, right? We're west of the Mississippi. Well, this could have several different shapes this frontier, but quite oftentimes, it's drawn out like a hump. And imagine this then having a whole bunch of different points with lots of different combinations of the two. So an example would be like this point might represent, I don't know, 60 million nacho fries. And let's say 3 million Skittles. Right? And so on and so forth. And that's what's basically described here in a much nicer looking example. In this example, they're using computers and cars and talking about what can be produced. Now, notice this. Look at that point right there and let's look at that point right there. You've got one that's inside the frontier and one that's outside the frontier. I think that's, yeah. So what's the story at point C? C is not a possible point. Remember what the name of this is. Production possibilities frontier. And I'm saying that C is not possible. And it's not possible because there's not enough resources to make it. This right here is the frontier. You can't go beyond the frontier. You can't do more than what you with than what you have as resources. So there's not enough resources to make C. At D. You're inefficient. Now, how do I know that I'm inefficient? 
because I can get more natural fries without giving up any Skittles. I'll repeat that again. Notice here, I one way I can say that D is inefficient is because I can get more natural fries without giving up any Skittles. Or I could get more Skittles without giving up any natural fries. Or I could get more of both. Look at what's true along the frontier. Along the frontier, let's put two points here, A and B. When I go from A to B, I have to give up natural fries to get more Skittles, which leads us to along the frontier, there's always a trade-off. And that's how we know that there's efficiency. Notice here, what was that, C, D. This was inefficient because I could get more without giving up the other. I could get more without giving up the other, or I could get more of both. A and B were efficient because to get more of one, to get more of Skittles, I have to give up natural fries. That's our trade-off, right? Which is, again, what economists are focused on is the measurement of that trade-off. And that's what's basically highlighted right here that I just talked about, um, is that within the production possibilities frontier, any point on the frontier is efficient. Points below the frontier are inefficient. And that along the frontier, there is a trade off. <laughs> Not that I'm trying to anticipate what the slides say, but hopefully it seems a little bit more natural when I'm talking about it than when you're reading it here um, on the slide. But sorry. Quantity of Skittles, quantity of natural fries. Here's my frontier. Again, here's A and B. So what we're saying here is that in going from A to B, there are several things present. A and B are both efficient. A to B represents a trade-off, right? Because you are getting, in this case, from A to B, you're getting fewer natural fries and you're getting more Skittles. And that the measurement of that trade-off has a name. And it's called the opportunity cost.
And what the opportunity cost essentially is, is the highest valued alternative for gone, which basically is, if we think back to chapter one, it's what I didn't do instead. In this case, more Skittles means fewer nacho fries. How many and at what point? Well, it depends on where we are in the frontier. As we can see here, the slope is not constant, meaning the opportunity cost is not constant. Now, there's a really cool description of why that's the case, um, which we'll get to in this chapter. So as I said here, the, the slope is not constant. And you can see that the opportunity cost is changing from left to right. That in fact, it's getting steeper from left to right. So that's the question. Why is the opportunity cost increasing as we quote unquote read the graph from left to right? Meaning, why is it the case? that when I say quantity of Skittles and quantity of nacho fries, why is the slope essentially flat here? And why is the slope steep here? Why is the opportunity cost typically changing? So imagine this kind of scenario. Think about the extremes on either side, right? And think about the nature of the products being produced. Um, you know, so my wife and I have very different jobs. You know, my wife deals with clients. Um, she's in finance and she deals with clients. So even though my wife and I do rather similar tasks, right? We deal with markets and, you know, we deal with the economy in some sense. It's very different, right? My, uh, my relationship, for instance, to all of you is more kind of a, a top-down relationship, right? You ask, um, I give or don't give, right? And it, it's kind of authoritative in some sense. It's, um, you know, uh, you know, I'm um, conducting a service, right, to you, educating you, but also, um, right, I'm also your advocate, but I'm also your professor, so I administer grades, whereas my wife's relationship to her clients, right, it's guided by regulations, it's guided by the law, it's guided by customer service, it's guided by the fact that her firm is on the mainland. Now, what if my wife all of a sudden did my job, right? If she's committed to customer service, then you totally should send her an email and say, Hey, hey, Lee, give me a uh, an A in the class. And she'd be like, okay, right? And give you an A in the class, right? And then I might, if I had to take her job, I could get a client that says, um, I don't think you're doing a good job. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? Of course I'm doing the right job. Get out of here, um, right? Because I'm used to one style of doing things and she's used to a different style of things. And I say that because now imagine the Skittle worker and the natural fry worker. What if we made every employee be a Skittle worker like they would be if we were right here? There are gonna be some people that don't like to make Skittles. Either they're diabetic or they're allergic to sugar or they don't like the Skittle factory. They don't like Skittles. And the other extreme too, right? 
if we made everyone make nacho fries, there's going to be people who sneeze smelling nacho spices. There's going to be people who don't like French fries. <laughs> God, what would that be? Um, right? But we can imagine all these kinds of individuals existing, but also the resources. Think about it. There, yes, I'm sure there is some sugar in a nacho fry, but there's very little. It's mostly carbs. Whereas for Skittles, it's mostly sugar, not that many carbs. But if you want to just grow sugar, you can use all your land to make sugar, but not all parts of the country are going to make tons, right? You can grow sugar, I'm sure, in like North Dakota. Uh, but it's probably easier to grow potatoes. And then those potatoes are used to make the carbs that are used to make french fries. So the trade-offs are so extreme because at the very extreme of making Skittles, let's say that this is point E. So point E, we're only making Skittles. But at that point, 10% of the population are diabetic. I'm using bad land to make sugar, right? Like land, like let's say in North Dakota. And let's just kind of be extreme here. And that diabetics are good at making fries. And that bad sugar land is good for making natural fries. And I say that because at point E, when we're only making Skittles, you're only getting a very small quantity increase in Skittles, but you're giving up a huge amount of natural fries. And we can see that because at that extreme point, where it is so steep, at point E, that I'm giving up to move from, let's say, D to E, I'm giving up a huge amount of natural fries to get only a very small amount of Skittles to go from D to E. Let's look at it the other way, though. What if I wanted to go from E to D? Easing back just a little bit on Skittles gives me a huge increase in natural fries. Because all of a sudden they can tell people in North Dakota, hey, stop growing sugar in your greenhouses and just start throwing potato parts in the ground and start growing lots of potatoes. And hey, you diabetic people, right? Stop being forced to work in the Skittle factory and start making natural fries. Now I'm well aware that diabetics can work in a sugar industry. I'm just using an extreme example to motivate this and to help you understand this. So that's why it's so steep at point E, because basically that the flatness and steepness of the production possibilities frontier is caused by this sort of mismatch of resources. But the resources are becoming mismatched in the production of the product, right? Forcing the diabetic to make Skittles, forcing North Dakota to grow sugar. This is not designed for it. Okay, now. Now that you have some understanding of how the production possibilities frontier is shaped, we can then also imagine that it can shift out. 
and it can shift out as technology gets better. It can also shift out um, as we get more people, so more resources. And what shifting out of the production possibilities frontier does, the reason why it's so good is because it allows us to, um, to, um, to make more of both products. So let's see how that looks right here. So one way you can do it is a differential shift here. Let's just use their example of computers and cars. So let's just say that a new patent is developed that allows me to put more processors on a computer chip. Well, that's not gonna really help me make more cars, that specific advancement. But being able to put more computer thingies on the chip is gonna really help me make more computers. And now notice what can happen between A and G. Now I can get more of both goods. Now let's just do a slightly different example. What if we just get more people? Let's just stick with their example of computers and cars. Again, this is quantity of computers, quantity of cars, and it's measuring how much of them are produced, not what's being consumed. If I get more people, we could imagine those people would probably be good at making both cars and computers. So now we could get a parallel shift of the production possibilities frontier. We could also imagine that we could also have something that only helps us in the production of cars. And then it would look like that. So you can get this shifting out, but this is the essence of economic growth is being able to shift the frontier. Now, economics as a whole is divided into two parts. After now we understand these models is that there's both microeconomics and macroeconomics. Microeconomics, which if, you're, if you've already taken it, that's Econ 130. This course is 131 macro. Focus on that first part. Micro is individual households, individual firms, how they make decisions, how they act. Macroeconomics, with the focus on macro there, is big picture, economy-wide phenomenon, inflation, unemployment, economic growth. Those are the big three. You do not want to leave this course, and I have failed you in my job if you don't understand those three underlined principles, three underlined concepts of inflation, senescence prices, unemployment, which is essentially working, and economic growth, which is essentially production. You need, and in fact, over a third of this course is devoted to understanding those three things. Now, another way to understand economics and the types of statements made is that there's a difference, a distinct difference between um, positive statements and normative statements. So positive statements are any, are any statements that are um, in essence, true or false. They are statements that are proved or disproved. So if I tell you something like, it is 80 degrees outside, let's say 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, it's either true or false, right? And I can go outside and I can see what is the temperature? And if it's 79 degrees, that positive statement is false. And I can prove it that it's false by taking the temperature. As it says here, describing the world as it is. In general, in this course, I tend to focus on making positive statements. And most economists do. Um, it's not the job of an economist to... I mean, we do have thoughts, we do share our thoughts with others, but that's 
you know, I, 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 at least I can't say the same from all of my colleagues, but um, I don't want this to be shitingnomics. I don't want you to, to take this class and just know how I think of the world. That seems, uh, that's why people have kids, right? So that they can make their kids <laughs> replicate what they think. I don't need a whole bunch of people taking Econ 131 to just repeat what I say, how I think about the world. So I clearly have thoughts, but I don't think that's the point of this course is that you learn my thoughts as opposed to, I don't know, it seems like, <laughs> like I'm generalizing and making an assumption, but it seems like people that are in, um, yeah, it seems like English does it a lot. People that take an English class, at least I remember from my undergraduate days, I don't think I ever took a an English course where there was a great deal of positive statements. It all seemed to be normative. So what is normative? How the world should be. <laughs> now, right, if I said something to you like, um, I don't know, like, uh, you know, I just made a, like a, a statement that just reflected my personal beliefs. Like, what if I just said something like, um, you know, I, not that you care whether I believe it or not. I'm just saying I don't believe it, um, but I'm making it, if, whether you believe it or not, I don't frankly quite care and you shouldn't care what my personal beliefs are. Um, what if I said something like, um, uh, let me just take an extreme example. What if I said something like, um, oh yeah, here's a, here's an example of one I heard not too long ago. Right, it was um, um, Trump saying he's the greatest president since Abraham Lincoln. Well, that's not provable, right? Like, on on what measure are we making that um, that description, right? Um, if we're talking about like number of Twitter messages sent, then yeah, totally, because Abraham Lincoln didn't send any Twitter messages, as far as I understand it. And Trump totally has, right? And if we're talking about miles of wall built in Mexico, then yeah, totally. Um, you know, Trump beats Lincoln. Um, you know, uh, but you can see, you can get a sense from how I'm saying that, how it's a, a belief, an opinion. And it can't be proved true or false because it is in that statement that person's vision of the world. As, as a counter example here, right? Instead of saying 80 degrees Fahrenheit, what if I just said, it's hot? You can't, can't prove whether it's hot or not because hot is a um, imprecise term, All right? So I live in Manoa and it was like in the mid 60s when I was waking up, right? And I told my parents it was cold and my parents live in Wisconsin. And they said, you are crazy for thinking that. Um, that's actually two uh, normative statements, right? Me saying that it's cold and also my parents calling me crazy because in this case, neither statement is uh, provable, right? Even saying someone is crazy. I mean, I mean technically speaking, First, it's an old antiquated term. You don't call people crazy. But also, it you can't, you know, when we think of someone being um, unwell, right, mentally or physically, um, it, we don't use the term crazy. We would say something like they scored a, a five on this scale. They scored a two on this scale. They scored a 1,000 on this test. Right? And we would say that those tests suggest that this person is unwell. We wouldn't just say the person's crazy because right, if I get mad enough, I'll call my kids crazy. Right. And if I, and then on the other hand, I might love my kids. Right. And it could depend on my mood. Um, generally speaking, as you're getting the sense here, I'm going to focus on making positive statements rather than normative statements in this course, as most economists do. Oh, a joke. Let's switch. I'll make the policy, you implement it, and he'll explain it. Jeez, ah, it's like consistently bad jokes. Um, so there are some economists who obviously get their pay 
and they do their job based on the fact that they are giving their opinions, that they are making normative statements. But typically, we see those economists you know, typically in Washington, and they work for the Council of Economic Advisors, where they make suggestions and they make public policy. That's not my job. I'm not. I don't work in public policy. Um, I have public policy beliefs, but I don't even like sharing them too often because they're not really provable, right? And all, I mean, you can try to prove them, but also part of it's just you know, general statements about um, things, right? Like I, for instance, um, I think that people who get Medicaid in Hawaii should have dental care benefits. For some reason, the state of Hawaii doesn't want to allow people who are poor and have health insurance from the state to not be able to go see a dentist. Yet what we know is that um, it's totally easy to get good dental habits established when you're a kid. If when you're a poor child, you get a chance to go to the dentist and the dentist gives you your free toothbrush and says, keep your teeth clean, right? Instead, what we're saying to a poor family is who has no money, not enough for food, they're not going to spend money to go to the dentist. So then they end up with really bad teeth that are then really expensive to fix when they're 30 and 40 years old. It doesn't make any sense to me is what I'm saying. Now, do you see how that statement, there's a lot of, there's a logic to what I said, but now I am saying it's an obligation of the state to provide dental care for the poor. Can't really prove it, right? It's my own personal belief about the world and how I think the world should work, but it's not provable. And there's some other organizations within the government that hire economists. Maybe one will take me on for my crazy dental idea. <laughs> um, you know, you can work for the president and be an economist. Um, I think it's a pretty dismal job. I don't think I would ever want to. I, I don't have very much to say about this because I don't tend to focus on public policy. There are some economists even at Manila who do focus on policy. And, you know, if you <laughs> if you want to, if you like that kind of thing, I'm not your guy. So um, there are others in the department who like that. And if you want to learn in that kind of way, reach out to me and I will tell you who to start looking for and working with. Now, even among normative theories, there are differences of belief, right? Based on those who are more conservative and those who are more liberal. But even among positive theories, there are different theories, right? So here we're kind of talking about political viewpoints. And we shouldn't be too surprised about that because obviously we know that some economists are conservative, most are conservative, and that there are some who are liberal, right? So this would be like the difference between, um, what's that one guy's name? Oh, like, um, you know, like on my Facebook feed, you always see like Robert Reich and he's like doing those examples. Did you know, by the way, Robert Reich, he actually, um, he dated Hillary Clinton before Bill Clinton met Hillary. Ah, that's pretty cool. Well, at least that an economist was, um, I don't know to what extent they were dating or how long they were dating for, but I don't know. It's, he's an economist. He does a lot of, He's very liberal. And so he, has, he basically spends his time usually talking about his own personal views about the world. So Robert Reich, as opposed to, um, this guy's dead, but he was very conservative. His name was Arthur Laffer, great last name. But Arthur Laffer, L-A-F-F-E-R, was a very conservative economist, right? And so you could imagine, um, or another very conservative economist would be uh, Martin Friedman. Right, you could have, again, very liberal and very conservative economists. But there's also differing points of view, even especially in macro about how the world works. So you've got Keynesians, you've got monetarists, you've got institutionalists, you've got lots of different views about even what theories and what assumptions to use.
And even among economists, there's going to be differences in the judgments that are made um, about how these variables are related and what the theories are going to be. There's not much I can really say about this, right? I mean, part of it would be you can have a difference in a value in terms of who the burden of taxes should be on, right? In um, in this case here, it would seem to be the case that in people taking water from the well, based on the different on the structure of this tax, that the poor, the jacks of the world are actually paying more in taxes as a percentage of their income than the rich. Jill, doesn't seem fair, doesn't seem right, but that's the way that this economy is structured. Right? And then we can have other things, um, other ways of understanding um, different um, economic policies. So one example would be rent control. Another example would be trade barriers. So let's talk about rent control. Rent control means that the, the city or the state puts a limit on how much can be charged in rent for an apartment. And you could see it as good because it makes sure that people can afford the, the housing that they have. But as we're going to learn um, in chapter four, a rent control, while it makes the housing more affordable, it then provides a disincentive for landlords to offer their place up for rent because they know they're not going to get that much. So now it's apartments are cheap if you're lucky enough to find one, right? And um, also it could be that, yeah, rent is cheap, but only people with a really junky, janky house offer their house for sale given that rent amount that can be charged. So rent control, it makes you seem popular among voters because it makes it look like you're trying to make their rent cheap, but it can lead to really substandard housing. And so as a result, most economists are against rent control. Because in generally we're in favor of markets as we learned in the last chapter. Trade barriers is another example. Generally speaking, economists are against trade barriers because what it does is it really only helps the um, producer of the product that's in that country whose thing is being protected, right? Like an example of this would be like in the 1980s, before many of you were born, um, in the 1980s, Japanese cars were taking over the US. So the, so the United States basically imposed trade barriers on Toyotas and Hondas coming in, imposed these really huge taxes and really huge quotas on things coming in to try to help GM and Ford and, and other American manufacturers of cars. But all that it did was it made people have to pay more for cars and get worse cars in terms of fuel standards. And in the end, the Japanese car makers like Toyota and Honda just ended up producing their products in um, the United States anyway. Okay. Um, just based on time, I'm not going to cover that. So let's um, finish this off by talking about what are the things that the economists most agree about. Well, we just covered the first two here. Um, in general, most economists agree that ceilings on rents are bad because they basically reduce the quantity and the quality of the housing. The tariffs and quotas are generally bad because it basically makes goods more expensive. And there's a whole bunch of others here. Which I'm happy to explain in further detail. But I'd, let, I'd encourage you to read each of these so that you get a good sense of what most economists believe. And I would say among these 20, I'm um, in agreement with them. Not that you then can be like, oh, I know how Shedding believes about the world. So now I'm just going to learn about what he thinks. But... I'm your quintessential economist. So me following the dictates of what it means to be an economist and these economists, their training, which is the same as mine, has led us all into a general agreement about this is the way that we think that the world should work.
It should give you a better understanding about why it is that economists are the way they are. Okay, so again, I'm not going to cover the appendix. The appendix is giving you a review of the mathematics, the simple mathematics that you're going to need for this course. I would encourage you to at least look it over quickly. But for most of you, um, you probably wouldn't have gotten admitted to UH even if you couldn't have done these very basic things with math. But give yourself a little bit of a review. Okay, so that's it for chapter two.